Why do the Muslims offer salah in Arabic when they do not understand it? Will it not be preferable to offer salah in a local or a regional language? The sister posed the question that when most of the Muslims don't understand Arabic, won't it be preferable to offer salah in the local or regional languages? Won't that be better? Sister, if for the sake of argument, if I agree with you, that let's offer salah in the local language. So in Bombay, there will be few people who will say, let's offer in English. Few may say Urdu, few may say Hindi, some may say Gujarati. There will be an infighting. Even if we come to a common opinion and agree that let's say in Masjid number one, Mosque one, we offer salah in English. Mosque two in Urdu. Mosque three in Hindi. Mosque four in Gujarati and so on and so forth. Again, there will be confusion and fighting. Some may say that in Masjid number one, where you're offering salah in English, we will follow the translation of Allama Abdullah Isafali. Some may say we will follow translation of Pikthar. Some may say Maulana Abdul Majid Daryabaji. Others may say Mohsin Khan. Again, they'll be fighting. Even if we agree that, okay, let's follow one particular translation. Yet, the translation sister is a human handiwork. It cannot substitute the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the word of the Prophet. And in translation, there can be mistakes. And if there are mistakes, this mistake will be attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, if you're offering Salaam Majid number two, where they're offering in Urdu. And suppose the Imam recites Surah Luqman, chapter 31, verse 34. And if you read the translation, most of the Urdu translations, they translate this verse of the Holy Quran as no one besides Allah has the knowledge of the sex of the child in the mother's womb. If you check the Arabic text, the Arabic word sex is not there in the Quran. It's the own interpretation of most of the Urdu translators. And if a doctor is offering salah, he will start thinking that what kind of a prayer is this that no one besides Allah knows the sex of the child in the mother's womb. Today we know by ultrasonography, we can very well identify sex of the child. He will start doubting. So therefore, you cannot read the translation. Because if you read the translation, and if you commit any mistake, the mistake will be attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if it's the verse of the Holy Quran, or to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if it's the hadith. And the translation cannot complete the full meaning. It can help you in somewhat knowing the meaning, to help you to concentrate. For example, since I'm a person who keeps on traveling. If I go to France, according to your logic, the Salah has to be offered in French. If the Salah has to be offered in French, but naturally even the Adhan should be in French. So if I go to France and the Muslim gives the Adhan in French, I'll be wondering who is he cursing. And if I go to the mosque and attend the Salah, it will be in French. I will wonder whether the Imam is praising Allah or telling a story in French. So if the Salah is in Arabic, irrespective whether I, as an Indian, who don't know French or German, if I go to Germany or France or Spain or any part of the world, if I offer Salah, I will at least know what I'm offering and I will know its meaning. And the Arabic Adhan is the international anthem of the Muslims throughout the world. International anthem of the Muslims throughout the world. He may belong to any part. He may belong to any part of the world. He will surely understand the meaning of that adhan. It's an international anthem. Therefore, sister, the best advice is that the Muslims should learn the language of the Holy Quran. If we don't know Quranic Arabic, then we should at least know the meaning, the translation, in the language you understand the best of those verses you read in the Holy Quran so that you will be able to derive the benefits of the Salah. Hope that answers the question. Next question from the brother on the right. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Rafiq Vadgaonkar, business. Many non-Muslims allege that when Islam is against idol worship, 
Why do the Muslims worship and bow down to the Kaaba in their prayers? So that was the question that many non-Muslims allege that when Islam is against idol worship, why do we bow down to the Kaaba and why do we worship the Kaaba? Indicating that we are the biggest idol worshippers. We Muslims, we bow down towards the Kaaba. The Kaaba is the Qibla. It's the direction. We don't worship the Kaaba. We bow towards the Kaaba. In a Salah, we only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. We in Islam, we believe in unity. Suppose the Muslim want to offer Salah here. Some may say, let's face north. Some may say, let's face south. Some may say east. Some may say west. Which direction do you face? So for unity, all the people in the world, all the Muslims in the world, they have been commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to face towards the Kaaba. If you are in the west, you face towards the east. If you are in the east, you face towards the west. If you are in the north, towards the south. If you are in the south, towards the north. All Muslims face in one direction for unity. And the Muslims were the first people who drew the world map. And when they drew it, they had the South Pole on top and North Pole down. And Alhamdulillah, the Kaaba, the city of Mecca was in the center. The Westerners came and they turned the map upside down. And today, we have the North Pole on top and South Pole down. But yet, Alhamdulillah, the Kaaba is yet in the center. <laughs> when we Muslims go for Hajj and men do the Tawaf, we circumambulate around the Kaaba. We circumambulate to indicate that every circle, all the circles have only one center. To indicate that we worship only one true Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. And the best answer was given by Hadrat Umar. May Allah be pleased with him, who was the second Khalifa of Islam. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, in volume number 2, chapter number 56. Hadith number 675 in the book of Hajj. Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he said to the black stone of Kaaba, Sangeswad, he said that you are only a stone. You cannot harm me nor benefit me. Had it not been that I had seen the Prophet kissing and touching you, I would not have kissed or touched you. This Hadith is sufficient to prove that we Muslims we don't worship the Kaaba. And the best answer you can give is that at the time of the Prophet, there were people who even stood on the Kaaba and gave the Adhan. I want to ask the question, which idol worshipper will stand on the idol he worships? I am Irshad from my final year computer engineering. Uh, how will you reply to a non-Muslim who says that Salah is nothing but uh, another form of gymnastics. So that was the question, but how do you reply to a non-Muslim who says that Salah is nothing but another form of gymnastics? Like what benefit you get there, you get there also. It's just a gymnastics, you know, standing up, bowing down, going down, etc. Brother, there is a world of a difference between Salah and gymnastics. In Salah, there is development of the body as well as of the soul. In gymnastics, you may develop the body, but there is no development of the soul. In Salah, you get mental peace and tranquility. You don't get tranquility and mental peace in gymnastics. In the Salah, the movements are smooth, without jerk. In gymnastics, the movements are with jerk. After Salah, it removes the laziness. After gymnastics, you get fatigued. After Salah, you feel like working. After gymnastics, you get tired, don't feel like working. Salah can be offered by people of all the ages. Gymnastics cannot be offered by people of all the ages. <laughs> Salah is absolutely free. In gymnastics, if you go to a good gymnasium, you have to pay through your noses. In Salah, you don't require any equipment. In gymnastics, you require, you know, the parallel bars and things, etc. In the Salah, in the Salah, the social conditions improve. 
the improvement of brotherhood, of unity, of solidarity. In gymnastics, there is no improvement of social condition. In the Salah, it guides you towards righteousness. It makes you a better human being. In gymnastics, it doesn't make you a better human being or it does not improve your righteousness. But the main reason we offer Salah is to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our niya should be there. Even if someone has a gymnastic, exactly same posture as the Salah, it will not be equivalent because in Salah we have the niya, the intention to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek His pleasure which you can never acquire in gymnastics. Assalamualaikum brother. My name is Sabasu. Why does Allah require us to praise Him? What benefit does He get? The sister asked the question that why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala require us to praise Him and in what way does He benefit? Sister, when we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or suppose someone says Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. It doesn't make Allah more greater. Allah is already the greatest. Whether you say Allah Akbar a million times or whether you don't say, Allah will yet remain the greatest. He is the greatest and will remain the greatest. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not for His benefit. And the answer is given in the Holy Quran, in Surah Fatih, chapter 35, verse number 15, that, O ye men, it is you who require Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is you who want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free of all wants, worthy of all praises. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not require us to praise Him for His benefit. He requires us to praise Him for our benefit. Because, but natural, we will follow the advice of a person who is famous, intelligent, popular and wise. You will not follow the advice of a person who is a stranger, unknown, who is not intelligent, who is not wise. Therefore, we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to satisfy ourselves that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most intelligent, the most wise, the most greatest, the supreme. So that's indicating that we should follow His commandments. That's the reason that in Surah Fatiha, the opening chapter which is always recited in the Salah, the first four or five verses are praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Praise be to Allah, the Lord of the world. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Most gracious, most merciful. Iyak na abdu wa iyak na sain. Dear alone we worship, dear alone we ask for help. We are praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to convince us that He is the greatest. He is the only person who you can go for ultimate help. And after this, then we recite the last few verses of Surah Fatiha. Ihdina Surat al-Mustaqeem. Surat al-Lazina namta alayhim, wa'id al-Maghdubi alayhim, walad ba'alleen. Show us the straight path. The path of those who have earned thy favor. And not of those who go astray. And not the path of those which is wrath. Therefore we pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to satisfy ourselves that He is worth asking for. He is worth taking the advice of. And then we ask for help and advice. For example, if a person has certain heart problems, he is sick. If a person who is unknown, who is a stranger, who you don't even know, he comes and gives you advice. Will you take his advice or will you take the advice of a person who you know is a very famous heart specialist? Whose advice will you take? But naturally you will take the advice of a person who is a heart specialist, who is a doctor. So therefore, we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to satisfy ourselves for our own benefit. But irrespective of however much you praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not sufficient. Because the Holy Quran says in Surah Qahaf, chapter 18, verse number 109, that if the ocean was made into ink, to write the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not exhaust even if you put to its aid another ocean. A similar message repeated in Surah Luqman chapter 31 verse 27 that if you convert all the trees on the earth into pen and the ocean, 
backed with seven ocean point supply into ink to write the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yet the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not exhaust. However much you praise, it is insufficient. But yet we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah requires us to praise Him not for His benefit, but He requires us to praise Him for our benefit so that we agree He is supreme, He is great, He is intelligent, He is most wise, so that we can follow His commandments and stay on the Sirat al Mustaqim, the true path. <laughs> Uh, my name is Jahangir, I'm a revert. My question is, uh, what should I do if my office timings do not permit me to pray on time? The brother asked the question that what should he do if his office timings do not permit him to pray on time? If you analyze the five daily salah, which is a fard, as far as the Fajr Salah, so the morning Salah, the Isha Salah, night Salah, these don't clash normally with the office timing. Even the Maghrib Salah doesn't clash. When it comes to Zuhar Salah, the afternoon Salah, it can be prayed during the lunch time. Most often, the lunch timing of the office matches the Zuhar Salah. The problem that arises mainly is in the Asar Salah. Or, you may have difficulties in other salahs if you are doing night shift, etc. But if you have problems, if your office timings are clashing with the timing of the salah, what you should do is that you should request your employer to give you a break of 10 minutes to offer your salah. But most of the Muslims, we are afraid to ask our employer for time of offering salah. For other things, we ask. We are going for picnic and going for weddings and birthday parties, you ask. But for offering salah, we feel shy. Most of the Muslims, they are apologetic, they have an inferiority complex. And your employer, even if he is a non-Muslim, my experience tells me that 99% time, he will give you time off for your salah. But you should request him nicely, humbly. But when he gives you time off, there are some Muslims, to take a break for more than an hour for salah. And they say, we have gone to a far off mosque. The employer will start thinking that have you gone for salah or have you gone for a stroll? I have got no objection a person goes to pray in the masjid, the mosque, if it's close by. If it's not close by, or it will take a lot of time, you can very well even pray in the office. You can have a compact pray mat, a musallah, and keep in a locker. As I mentioned in my talk, our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Salah, chapter number 56, hadith number 429. That the earth has been made for me and my followers as a masjid, as a place for doing sujood. Therefore, when the time for prayer is up, you can pray. You can even offer in your office, see to it that you find a very clean place, and you can offer Salah. Don't pray extra nawafil, etc. Pray your Farah Salah as well as Sunnah the Mokidah. That is sufficient. But there are some people who, when they go to offer Salah and if they find that picture is obstructing them for Salah, they take out the picture. Or they cover the picture with the cloth. If the picture is obstructing your Salah, pray in another room. Why do you have to pray in the room which has the picture? Go in another room. Then there are some people who in a non-Muslim office, they want to make a jamaat. I have got no objection to make a jamaat. But see to it that all the Muslim employees in the office don't leave the work simultaneously so that the office work comes to a standstill. You can very well pay in several jamaats. As if you see, it's mentioned in Bukhari, volume number one, in hadith number six to seven, in the book of Adan, chapter number 35, it says that even a jamaat can be made by two people. Even two people are suffering for jamaat. So if you are working on Muslim atmosphere, don't put the office work at standstill. Offer in very jamaat. And if a person, if a Muslim works dedicatedly, honestly, no employer, even if he is a non-Muslim, will prevent you from a break for offering salah. 
If your employer is uncompromising, you can very well bargain with him and tell him that, okay, I will not take my tea break. Please give me break for my Asar Salah. Or you can say that if I take a 10 minute break after office hours, I will work double. I will work triple. I will work for half an hour free of charge. Don't give me overtime. Any businessman will agree with the person who will 10 minutes off and is working half an hour extra after office hours. Normally I have to pay double or one and a half times. So you tell him I will work thrice the time of the break and don't give me a single pie. He will surely agree. But an extreme case is if your employer is among the one percent or uncompromising at all, the best option for you remaining is that you change the job. Offering salah is far. If the employer is among the one person who doesn't give you offer salah, change the job. You may never know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you a job in which you may earn more. But irrespective whether you earn more or less in the new job, offering salah will gain you more benefit in the year after than not offering and getting a few hundred rupees more. Unfortunately, even in some of the Muslim offices, which have most of the employees in it, Muslims, they don't offer salah. Neither alone, neither in Jamaat. I would like to request all the Muslim brothers that in the office, they should see to it that they themselves, along with their employees who are Muslims, they should offer salah. And there are always ways in which you cannot disturb your office work and yet offer salah. In fact, in the long run, if you offer salah along with the employees, it will help you in your business and you will make more profit. Hope that answers the question. Assalamualaikum, brother. Are women allowed to pray in the mosque? The sister has a question that are women allowed to pray in a mosque? There is no verse in the Holy Quran which prohibits a woman from praying in the mosque. Neither is there any authentic hadith which says that a woman cannot pray in a mosque or go to a mosque. In fact, there are several hadith which speak the opposite. If you read Sahih Bukhari volume number one, the last hadith, hadith number 832 of the book of characteristics of Salah, which is chapter number 84, it says that when your wife asks to go to the mosque, do not forbid them. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Characters of Salah, chapter number 80, Hadith 824. It says that when the woman asks you to go to the mosque at night, allow them. Even at night, when they ask you to go to the mosque, the Sahih Bukhari, volume one, Hadith number 824 says that you should allow them to go to the mosque. It is also mentioned in Sahih Muslim. With Sahih Muslim, volume number one in the book of Salah, chapter number 175, hadith number 881, it says that Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that the best row for the men are the first row and the worst are the last row. The best row for the women are the last row and the worst are the first row, indicating that men and women pray together in the mosque and when they pray together, the best row for the men is the first row and the best for the women is the last row. The worst for the men is the last row, and worst for the women for the first row. There are several hadith. If we say Muslim, one number one, in the book of Salah, chapter 177, hadith number 884, it says that do not prevent the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to go to the mosque. Say Muslim, volume one, book of Salah, chapter number 177, hadith number 891, it says that do not take away the share of the mosque of the woman. That means during the time of the Prophet, the women did go to the mosque and Prophet never prevented them from entering the mosque. But whenever women enter the mosque, there should be equal and separate facility in the mosque. There should be no intermingling of the sexes, like how you have in the other place of worship. Otherwise, People will go more for east teasing than to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Separate entrance, separate wudu facility, separate place for prayer. And but natural, a woman cannot stand in front of the men. 
otherwise the men will concentrate more on the women than on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Equal but separate facilities. If it's side, then preferably a partition or they should pay behind. Equal but separate facilities. If you analyze, if you go to Saudi Arabia, the women allowed in the mosque. Even the Harmain, Harmain Sharif, the Masjid Haram in Makkah and Masjid Nabi in Medina, the women allowed in the mosque. You go to America, women allowed in the mosque. You go to UK, women allowed in the mosque. You go to South Africa, women allowed in the mosque. Women are allowed in the mosque in almost all parts of the world. It's only in India that most of the mosques do not give permission for the women to enter. But Alhamdulillah, there are a few mosques in Bombay which I know of which do allow women to enter. And when I'd been to Kerala last year, they told me that there were no less than 500 mosques in Kerala alone which had separate facilities for the women to pray. <laughs> so Inshallah, I believe that all those who are trustees of the mosque, even they refer to the Sahih Hadith and they do not prevent the female servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from entering the mosque even in Bombay. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Sheikh Ahmed, working profession, and my question to Brother Zakir is what is the significance of raising our hands while saying uh, takbir during salah? So brother asked the question that what is the significance of raising the hands when we say takbir in salah. Hands are a symbol of power and force. When Muslims raise the hand in salah, it mainly signifies three things. First, we are submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By raising our hands, we are signifying who has to say that, Oh Allah, I submit to you. Like, how when we want a person to surrender, we say, hands up. You know, police say, hands up to the, to the robber. In that, you're telling him that you surrender. So when you do hands up, we are surrendering to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And simultaneously, when we raise a hand, it also signifies the glorification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My action, as well as the words, Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. And besides that, when we raise a hand and fold it over the chest, we are giving a signal that I am facing my back toward the worldly affairs and giving up everything to concentrate on the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hope that's the question. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Yusuf Desai. I'm retired government official. My question is, at what time in the life of Holy Prophet Salah was ordained by Almighty. And what are the achievements of Shabbi Miraj? These two questions I think are related. Therefore, I put the questions. So there was a question that at what time, exact date, he wants, was a beloved prophet ordained to offer Salah? And what is the significance of Miraj in connection with Salah? Brother, exact date, day, like how we know when he died, when he was born, we don't know. But it was towards the early part of his prophethood. Because there are hadiths telling us that how did Archangel Gabriel show him to offer salah? What he did? He put his foot in the ground and then water gushed forth from the ground. And Archangel Gabriel, he showed to the prophet how to do wudu. And he showed him how to do salah. Same thing the prophet came home and repeated in front of his wife, Vivi Khatija, may Allah be pleased with her. So it was ordained in the early part of his prophethood. Regarding how many salah exact to offer, and regarding the second part of the question, that's Sabi Mehraj, which is an indication is given in the Holy Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 1, which says that the Prophet was transported from Masjid Haram to Masjid Aqsa. And then it talks about the Mehraj and the description between Sahih Bukhari and the Sahih Hadith, that how he meant and he met the other Prophets, Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, Moses peace be upon him, Jesus peace be upon him, Abraham peace be upon him, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained the Prophet that the Muslims should offer 50 times salah. When he came down, Musa alayhi salam, according to Sahih Hadith, Sahih Bukhari, it says that 50 will be too difficult for the Muslims. Go and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, request him to make it less. He goes, when the salah is made less, again he comes back, again the Prophet goes to make it less, and finally, in the ending, the salah is made to five times. The salah 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala agrees and says to the Prophet that offer five times salah. And then he says that this five times will be equivalent to 50 times of salah. So then. Assalamu brother. I'd like to ask you, why aren't all our prayers or supplications answered or fulfilled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The first has posed the question that why are all our prayers not answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Sisters, the answer to this question is given in the Holy Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 216, which says, But it is possible that you may dislike a thing which is good for you, and you may love a thing which is bad for you. For Allah knoweth everything and you know not. Allah says in the Holy Quran, it's possible that you may dislike a thing which is good for you and you may love a thing which is bad for you. For example, if a very religious pious person prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that please give me a motorcycle so it will help me in traveling and his prayer is not answered. You will say, what a pious person, religious person, why is his prayer not being answered? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that if he acquires a motorcycle, he may have an accident and he may get crippled. As the Holy Quran says, that you may love a thing which is bad for you. Allah knows, you know not. Once, there was a very rich businessman who was going to catch a flight to London to click a deal which would fetch him a profit of more than a billion rupees. When he's traveling towards the airport, unfortunately, there is an unusual traffic jam on the road. And he's unable to reach the airport on time. By the time he reaches the airport, the flight has already taken off. He misses the flight. He says in a very sorrowful tone, this is the worst thing that has happened to me in my life. While going back home, on the radio in the car, he hears the latest news that the flight which you are supposed to catch, which was going to London, it crashed and all the passengers in that flight, they died. So the businessman says, this is the best thing that happened to me in my life. <laughs> a few moments ago, he was cursing the traffic jam. Because of the traffic jam, he lost billions of rupees. A few moments later on, he thanks the traffic jam because it saved his life. As the Quran says, you may dislike a thing which is good for you. Allah knows, you know not. Allah knows that the life of the businessman was much more precious than the billions of rupees he was about to earn. Therefore, if you analyze that, whatever you ask, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, many a time, he does not fulfill your prayers. He does not answer your prayers. And it's mentioned in the Holy Quran in Surah Shura, chapter 42, verse number 27, that if Allah were to increase, if Allah were to increase the provision of His servants, they would surely transgress all bonds on the earth. For Allah gives it to them in due measure, and He knows what he gives. The Holy Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 186 that when they ask thee concerning me, tell them, I am close to them. I am very close to them. And I listen to every supplicant of my servant. The message is repeated in Surah Ghafir chapter 40 verse number 60 that the Lord says, ask me and I will answer your prayer. The Holy Quran says that Allah says, Ask me and I will answer your prayer. People may think that this verse isn't fulfilled if your prayers aren't answered. Actually, if you analyze, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is answering your prayer by not answering it. Because He knows what is good and bad for you. There are some people who may say that we see many unbelievers, many unpious people who pray to false God and they lead a very luxurious life. These unbelievers, they pray to false God for money and they get wealth. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if these unpious, unbelievers, they pray to false God, He fulfills their material desires because He knows that what they are asking for is actually going to cause them more loss in the long run. In the year after, it's going to cause nothing but loss. The true believers are those, irrespective whether they are rich or poor, whether they are in good times or bad times. They yet believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the Holy Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter 24, verse 37, that by the believers who neither traffic or merchandise can divert from remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from establishing prayers, from giving regular charity, from humbling themselves. For these people only fear that day on which heart and eyes will be transformed. They only fear the akhirah, the day of judgment, which is the final day of accounting. A true believer always says Alhamdulillah, irrespective of whatever happens. Alhamdulillah means praise be to Allah. Even if he goes in loss, he says Alhamdulillah. Because he has faith in Allah, that if Allah allowed this loss to be incurred, it has to be beneficent for him in the long run. In short, a true believer believes in Allah that whatever happens, happens for good. Hope that answers the question. Assalamualaikum. My name is Nayar Azam and I'm an engineer by profession. My question is very close to the question posed by from Sister Side in the beginning that the Juma Khutbah, which is not a part of the Salah, is it compulsory to deliver in the Arabic language? So, better pose the question that is it compulsory to deliver the Juma Khutbah in Arabic? There are differences of opinion among the scholars. But with the exception of Imam Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, all the other scholars, including Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmad bin Ambal, and all the other scholars, most of them, may Allah be pleased with them all, they agree that if the audience, if the congregation cannot understand Arabic, the Jummah Khutbah can be given in any other language. But the minimum requirement of Jummah Khutbah, that is praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sending the blessing on the Prophet and the Arabic verses to be recited in the Jummah Khutbah, they should at least be in Arabic. The remaining part can mean any language. There is not a single authentic hadith in which the Prophet said that the Jummah Khutbah cannot be given in any other language. But I do know that the Prophet always gave the Khutbah in Arabic. And the reason was because the people of Arabia at that time, they only understood Arabic. So because there is the Arabic, the Prophet always gave the Qudbah in Arabic. But no hadith says that he prevented people from giving the Qudbah in any other language or he told other people not to give the Qudbah in any other language. The reason the Jummah Qudbah is there is because to guide the congregation towards the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet as well as to give them some guidance about the latest happenings in the community. In short, it is to guide and give advice to the Muslim Ummah. It will be illogical to say that I will give guidance to a person in a language he doesn't understand. So, but naturally when you give guidance, you should give in the language you understand. If you go to America, in America, they have the Juma Khutbah in English. Many mosques, many mosques throughout the world, they have Khutbah in the local language. In America, in Canada, in UK, in South Africa, many mosques have the Khutbah in English. If you go to Arabia, the Arab countries, since the people understand Arabic, the Khutbah there is in Arabic. But last month when I had been to Kuwait, both the majority people of Kuwait understand Arabic, yet a few mosques had the Qutbah in English, a few mosques had the Qutbah in Urdu, a few mosques even had Malayalam and other languages. This the government has given special permission so that the expatriates, those people who are not the residents of Kuwait, those who come from outside Kuwait for employment in Kuwait, they will receive guidance in the local language. So Qutbah can be given any language but the condition is that praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be in Arabic. 
the blessings invoking on prophet should be in arabic and the dua that you have should be in arabic which can consist even of few verses few lines which you can also translate in your khutbah so there is no harm at all in fact people should be encouraged so that they get guidance it should be given in the local language except the few parts i mentioned it should be in arabic which can also be translated it's in india most parts of india and those mosques controlled by the indian immigrants abroad where the khutba is only in arabic a few mosques have a pre khutba a new thing pre khutba which is in the local language a few mosques have translation of the khutba after the juma salah therefore i request and i pray to allah subhanahu wa taala that may he also give hidayah to the people in india that even in india we have the khutba in the local language so that we get guidance every week during juma